You're watching The Legal Breakdown. So, Glenn, we've got breaking news from The New York Times and ProPublica that Donald Trump may owe the government an additional $100 million after double dipping on some tax breaks. Can you explain what happened here? Yeah, let me try to take our viewers uh, through this. It's kind of dense, and any time tax law gets involved, it, it can pretty quickly become confusing. But here are the basics. So in the early 2000s, Donald Trump decided he was going to build a glass-encased 92-story skyscraper in Chicago, took out lots and lots and lots of loans from Deutsche Bank and elsewhere. And ultimately, after he built the building, he realized he couldn't sell the space and he couldn't meet his financial obligations. He couldn't even service his debt. So under a provision of the IRS tax code, he had the building declared worthless. He is one heck of a businessman declared worthless for tax purposes. And he took a $651 million loss on his taxes in 2008. But he wasn't done there, Brian. Two years later, in 2010, what he did, according to the New York Times and the ProPublica reporting, is he then shifted ownership of the building from one of his partnerships to another of his partnerships. The New York Times reporting equates that with basically moving your coins from one of your pockets to the other pocket. And then he declared another loss, this time $168 million. And he got himself a nice tax refund as a result of $73 million. Now, this was all discovered, it looks like in part, by some of the evidence that came out in his New York fraud trial. There was also a 2022 congressional report discussing some of this, and a whole bunch of investigative journalists put it all together. And they're now reporting out that it looks like he may have violated tax laws to the tune of about $100 million plus penalties, plus fees, plus interest. And I am no tax expert, but in the New York Times article, they said they consulted with six tax experts um, one is on record in the article, a gentleman named Walter Swidetsky. Apologies of, if I'm mispronouncing the good professor's last name. And this, uh, this law professor is an expert on the law of partnerships and taxation. And here is his assessment. This is a quote. He said of Donald Trump, quote, I think he ripped off the tax system. Close quote. And I, <laughs> yeah. I will leave it with Professor Swidetsky's estimation of what Donald Trump appears to have done here. Yeah, it seems like a safe bet. Even if you even if you don't dig into the details of Donald Trump, it's a safe bet to just say that Donald Trump has probably ripped off the tax system. Glenn, can the government still go after any of these funds? Is there a statute of limitations issue here? What 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 could happen next? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't want to pretend to know more than I do about the tax laws and the tax regulations. But what I will say is, even if there are statute of limitations issues, those generally apply to criminal prosecutions, not to the government collecting money. It is owed courtesy of tax fraud. So uh, all of this, and it also depends on whether this was an ongoing course of criminal conduct. You know, one of the things that I, I think we we don't always recall when we're talking about a statute of limitations, which is just a fancy term for how long after the commission of the crime can somebody be prosecuted. In the federal law, lots of crimes have a five-year statute of limitations. I will say as a former career prosecutor, Brian, I was never fond of statutes of limitations because, think about it, somebody commits an egregious crime and as long as they can keep it hidden for five years and a day, they're home yeah. free, that always felt a little suspect to me. But the thing is, if you're in an ongoing conspiracy, including potentially to cover up your tax fraud and hide it from the IRS, from the federal government, that can often extend the statute of limitations because the statute doesn't begin to run until the very last act of the crime has been completed. So. It's an open question. We don't know enough to say whether there will or will not be statute of limitations problems attendant to this possible tax fraud. And is this a, a federal or a state crime? And, and who would bring him to court based on that question? So here's the thing. Anytime somebody commits tax fraud, you are committing crimes in violation of the federal law 
and in violation of the state law. Unless, of course, you defraud the federal government out of your taxes, but for the same transaction or for the same calendar year, you correctly report and pay all your state <laughs> right. court, your, your, your right. state taxes. Doesn't make any sense. Which is why, you know, I've had a beef with the federal government for a very long time over, you know, what seems to be its neglect of holding Donald Trump accountable for financial crimes and most, most directly, the tax implications of those financial crimes. Because I am quite sure all of the evidence that came out during Donald Trump's New York fraud trial that implicated New York state tax violations also violated federal tax laws. Now, why the federal government has never decided to really go after Donald Trump for alleged violations of federal tax laws, now that's a stone cold mystery to me. And to that point, then, you know, obviously, Donald Trump is a con man and a criminal and a fraud. We know that. But double dipping on a hundred million dollars worth of tax breaks strikes me as a pretty big red flag for the government. Like, how, how does the IRS miss this? And is this not also deserving of major condemnation on the government's side? Yeah, I, I don't I, I have a hard time believing, Brian, that the IRS missed this. Here we are some 15 years down the road from these potential, you know, tax violations and Donald Trump has not been held accountable. Now, there is some indication in the reporting that the IRS has been looking into this for years, but that sort of begs the question, why haven't they taken action? Um, what I will say is that our federal government does not do a very good job going after what I call the ruling class criminals. You know, the millionaires, the billionaires, the American oligarchs, whether in big yep. oil or big tech or the military industrial complex, big pharma, big entertainment, big internet, you know, any of it, we don't do a particularly good job. And when I say we, I was a federal prosecutor for decades. Now, I focused more on violent crime and RICO organizations than I did on white collar fraud cases. But, you know, we seem to forever be willing to deal with these legal transgressions when we find them by having these, you know, well-moneyed potential defendants pay fines, pay back taxes, pay penalties, and pay interest, but never seeing one minute of criminal accountability for what they did. And you know what that encourages, Brian? It encourages these people to do it all over again yep. and simply work into their operating budgets the fines and penalties, back taxes and interest, they know they're going to have to pay. So for them, it feels like it is forever a business decision because they seem to be very rarely held accountable as sort of a criminal law matter. Right. At this point, they basically say, like, let's just go for it. Worst case scenario, we get a slap on the wrist that is just paying what we would have had to pay anyway. But more likely, we won't have to pay anything. I mean, Donald Trump got away with $100 million in double dipping on taxes and waited. the government waited, what, 15 years for the, for the New York Times and ProPublica to do a story on it before we even see any action? You know, if I had my way um, and you put me in charge, I, I never wanted to be a dictator for a day like some others. But what I would do is turn the criminal justice system on its head. You know, we do a very good job at going after somebody who snatches a purse or sells a rock yep. of crack, particularly when they are, you know, folks without any power or influence or connections or wealth. Often they are, you know, our minority brothers and sisters. Boy, we go at them like gangbusters, but we lay off the ruling class criminals. I, for one, would turn the criminal justice system on its head. Why? Because if you sell a rock of crack or you snatch a purse, don't get me wrong, those are not victimless crimes. And we need to pay attention to the experience of the victims in each and every crime. But when you talk about the ruling class criminals, the billionaires who are committing crime, they will do damage to large swaths of the American population. As far as I'm concerned, that's where we should be focusing our law enforcement efforts on the people doing the most harm, on the people creating the most victims in our country. I would turn our priorities on their heads and I would start to actually equally apply the law to everybody. Then again, I don't think I'm ever gonna be dictator for a day. Uh, Glenn, let's finish off with this. 
practically speaking, I think, you know, based on what, what you've said, based on what we can all see, it's highly unlikely that the federal government will decide to go after Donald Trump for this $100 million in, uh, in double dipping on, on tax breaks. But if the, if the state of New York went, went after him, where would we most likely see a, a lawsuit emanating from? Would that be Letitia James? Would it be Alvin Bragg? You know, I feel like Letitia James has done her part. She has stepped up. She brought a massive fraud lawsuit, not a prosecution, but a lawsuit to try to recover some of the money that, you know, Trump and company bilked the New York taxpayers out of. And she won an enormous judgment against Donald Trump, about half a billion dollars. Of course, Donald Trump is also laboring under an $83 million judgment that was won against him by E. Jean Carroll. So here he may end up, what, owing another $100 million in back taxes to the federal government. Maybe they can take it out of his prison pay after he <laughs> yes, gets convicted, right. <laughs> after he gets convicted in one or more of yeah, his at a, at a rate of like uh, At a rate of what, like $2 a day? Yeah, uh, they'll, they'll get yeah. about 10 cents a day. Yeah. Um, but, but to answer your question, you know, I feel like enough with the civil suits being brought against Donald Trump. Not that I would sort of dismiss anybody who has a winning cause of action against Donald Trump. But, you know, at this point, it's all about deterring this kind of conduct. And the, the way to most directly deter not only Donald Trump, for, but others who would choose to follow in his footsteps is to prosecute them for their crimes. So, you know, if there are cases to be brought based on this latest revelation, I sure hope the evidence supports bringing criminal prosecutions against him, not just trying to claw back some of the money that he never should have received in the first place. Right. The whole point should be that there has to be some deterrent here so that he and people like him don't just keep thinking that this is OK, because that's the message that they're getting right now, not just on the tax stuff, but basically on everything. I mean, there's a reason that Donald Trump is so quick to try to engage in the same activities, um, election un undermining activities that he engaged in in 2020. That's because we have been so slow to prosecute the guy. The fact that we can't deliver swift accountability, all it does is serve to embolden the very criminals who committed these crimes in the first place. Um, with that said, we'll continue to keep an eye on this. It is, you know, a pretty sad commentary on, on the state of criminal justice in this country that it takes the New York Times and ProPublica to, to, um, to unveil what's happening here before the, the federal or state governments will actually do something to, to, to make up for it. But again, we'll keep an eye on it. And hopefully we do see some movement so that, again, to, to the exact point I was making, uh, we don't continue to embolden these criminals uh, like Donald Trump. With that said, uh, I'm Brian Tyler Cohen. And I'm Glenn Kirshner. You're watching The Legal Breakdown.